Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inizor Education. Um, I would like to continue talking about um, properties of light. Um, in this case, um, I'm kind of changing the name of the topics. We used to have something which we called properties of light. Now, um, let's talk about phenomena of light. Uh, it's basically the same thing, just a continuation. Certain phenomena of light we have already discussed in the previous topics. Uh, whenever we're talking about um, properties of light. For example, reflection, refraction, and some others. Um, this topic is more about the details of each of these um, phenomena, if we can say so. So, today we'll talk about a very important principle. It's called Huygens principle. Well, Huygens is the name of the Dutch mathematician and physicist. Um, some, sometimes it's pronounced Huygens, sometimes Huygens. Doesn't really matter. Um, what matter is that he has introduced a very important um, approach to understanding what actual light is. Now, uh, historically there were two different approaches to explain the different properties and phenomena of light. One of them is called corpuscular, that's when um, light consists of certain um, tiny um, corpuscles, like molecules if you wish, um, which are actually flying from the source of the light to whatever uh, light goes. Now, this was an interesting concept um, one of the proponents of this was a very authoritative figure of Isaac Newton, um, but it did not explain um, some phenomena. For, for example, it was fine when we were talking about a reflection. So when reflection goes, light goes this and then this. Well, that's kind of like like a billiard ball, basically. So the Corpuscular theory was was fine with this. It's just a reflection, mechanical reflection, so to speak. But whenever we were talking about something different, for example, um, we once talked about a refraction whenever the light goes at the angle here, it changes the it changes the direction between, let's say, air and glass. Now, that was not really very easy to explain using corpuscular theory. Uh, Newton was trying to explain it in some way. Um, let's not go into the details, but it was really, I mean, it was obviously wrong, basically, let's put it this way. Um, so, the new theory, new explanation actually was needed. And um, Christian, uh, Huygens was actually suggesting this particular explanation and that's what I will go into the details right now and using this explanation I'll try to explain some phenomena which this particular approach is actually very good for. Okay, so um, the first and most important um, aspect of Huygens principle, as, as we call it right now, was that light is actually the waves. Now, what kind of waves we know? Well, at least in 17th century, we will definitely, um, we, we, we could definitely talk about sound waves. Um, so, what is the sound wave? Sound waves is basically change, mechanical change of the density of the air and this longitudinal change. So whenever, if, if this is the source of, of sound, then it actually makes more dense um, the uh, air around it. And then it was uh, the opposite effect. This density was transferred to the next layer and next layer and, and, and then spherical um, uh, wave fronts, we can talk about wave fronts, um, where um, propagating from the source of, uh, of the sound. So it's longitudinal 
um, uh, oscillations or waves of uh, of air of some some environment in this case maybe it's metal if if this or water whatever the sound is propagating in so the idea of Huygens was that we have something which is like penetrating everything it's called ether or ether it's spelled sometimes like this or letter A sometimes uh, goes in front of it, ether. So the idea of this substance, so to speak, is that it's everywhere, including the outer space. So it penetrates everything. And um, the light is actually a longitudinal, longitudinal, what's important, longitudinal oscillations of, of ether. That was his idea. Now, similarly to sound, the light in the ether is supposed to be propagating in, in waves. So, he introduced the concept of a wave front. So, what is a wave front? Let's just be... By, by the way, it exists not, on, not only in, in, in light, but it exists in sound as well, and in any other waves, like waves on the uh, surface of water. Now, what is the wave front? Well, wave front is basically the um, number of or set of all the points around the source where the light or sound or water waves reach at the same time maximum on a maximum distance from the source. So the wave front moves; it expands from the source to all the directions and uh, wherever it managed to reach and all the points which basically are on the same time uh, synchronization so all the points where the oscillations have reached at that time t that's the wave front so it's furthest most from the source and simultaneously achieving this oscillation so this is the wave front that's it's pretty nice um, uh, definition we can use it obviously so what was the principle which Huygens actually um, uh, has suggested his principle was the following let's say at any time t there is some kind of a wave front wherever it is doesn't really matter now at time t equals to zero if the source of the oscillation is let's say a point then the wave front is basically that particular point at time t zero it doesn't really uh, propagate anywhere but let's say at time t greater than zero the oscillations reached certain point uh, points around this source. So if the source is a point, then obviously it's uh, a kind of a sphere around this point at some kind of time t. So at that time, at that time t, each point on the wave front is considered to be a source of secondary oscillations. So the oscillation of this particular point causes oscillation around it. So during some extra time, let's say delta t, we have all these oscillations around it. So there is some kind of a mini sphere which has been formed during the time delta t after certain uh, time t. Now, what happens then? This point is a source. Now, this next point to the source, next point to the source, all these are sources of secondary oscillations. So, where is the wave front? Well, according to Huygens, the wave front is the curve which envelopes these things. Now, the enveloping curve is basically a mathematical um, uh, concept. It's very well defined, etc. Like in this particular case, it actually means it's the curve which is tangent to all these little circles. 
So the mini circles represent what actually is the wave front from one particular point on the big, on the real uh, wave front, which formed during the time delta t. So if this is my original circle, uh, dotted circle was the wave front of at, at time t, then this, uh, the new front, new wave front, which is tangent to all these little circles, would be a wave front at t plus delta t. So that's the next thing. Where delta t is obviously assumed very small one. So that's how our mm, oscillations propagate. So they reach certain point, and then each point is a source of propagation around it. So there is a small circle. Okay. Now, uh, how this idea actually came to his mind? I mean, I, I'm always interested in knowing how basically people came with certain very interesting ideas. Well, maybe, uh, I don't know it from him, he lived in 17th century, but I'm just assuming, and it's actually written in many books as well. Let's just assume such a very simple experiment with a sound. So let's say you have two rooms with a door in between. Now, one room is where you are sitting. Another room is where the source of the sound, let's say somebody is playing a violin. Now, let's just think about how the sound propagates from one room to another. So this is a violin and this is a human being. Now, the sound doesn't go this way because there is a wall here. But sound goes this way, and from here it goes this way. Why? I mean, there is no reflection here. There is no sound mirror or anything like that. It's just because every uh, little uh, molecule which is oscillating here, and the sound definitely reaches this door, obviously, right? It becomes a source of secondary oscillation. Oscillation of this molecule causes the oscillation of molecules around it. So that's why it, it's something which, which I believe might, might, might cause this kind of train of thought. So it looks like there is a secondary um, oscillation which is caused uh, by those molecules of air which are already oscillating because of the real sound reaching this particular thing. So real oscillations from, from the source goes here and secondary oscillation goes to us. Now, this particular human being is thinking, I mean, if you will ask where is the sound from, he would point on the door, because from his perspective the sound is from the door, not from the violin. He doesn't see it, he doesn't hear direct sound. So he cannot determine this as a source of sound. This would be the source of sound. So the same thing with light, basically. He assumed that reaching certain point in ether or ether, whatever you call it, um, the light uh, actually is oscillating and it's causing the oscillation of other um, points of this, uh, of this ether. And that's how uh, it propagates. So this is the idea. So again, reaches certain point points actually at time t, the wave front, and each point of the wave front is the source of secondary oscillation, which gives all these little spheres around it. Okay, so that's how it is. Now let's just think about the wave front again. What is the wave front of point if we are talking about um, uniform environment? Let's say vacuum. Well, Obviously, since the speed of light is the same in all directions, um, the set of points where the light is reaching at the same time would be on a surface of the sphere. And the radius will be, obviously, c times t. That's the radius, where c is the speed of light and t is the time. 
Now, the speed of light, as I said, is in uniform environment, is the same in all directions. So, whenever there is a certain time t greater than zero, the light will go along this distance, and that would be the radius of the sphere around this point. Now, again, just out of exercise, what is the uh, wave front if the source of light is a straight line in three-dimensional space? Well, obviously it would be some kind of a cylinder, right? Because from this point on the same distance would be a cylindrical surface. So a cylindrical surface will be um, the wave front increasing the radius of the cylinder as the time is increasing. Again, I consider that the speed is the same in all direction. It's a uniform environment. And the last source of light which I would like to consider is a plane. So if you have a plane in space, infinite plane obviously I'm talking about, and it's the source of light, so the light goes up and down, let's say, or only up, doesn't really matter, and how does it go actually? What would be the wave front? What would be the set of points where the light reaches at the same time? Well, obviously it would be parallel plate. So it goes further and further up or down, whatever. And the rays of light would be obviously perpendicular to this surface. So these are different shapes the wave form can take. So, let's talk about, uh, again, single point as the source of light. So, the wave front is a sphere, now, at time t. Now, um, so what would be time t plus delta t? During the time delta t, there will be a small circle of oscillations produced by uh, each particular point where the light has already reached, right? So it will cause the oscillation of all points around it. And obviously all these spheres, little spheres, will be of the same radius, because again they're talking about uniform environment. So delta t multiplied by uh, t, that would be the radius of the small circles. So this small radius is c times delta t. This one is ct plus c times delta t would be c times t plus delta t would be the radius of the sphere which is enveloping all these spheres. Well, it sounds nice, obviously. However, it's a theory. I mean, it must be, you know, somehow confirmed and also it must explain certain phenomena of the light. Like, for instance, refraction. Okay, so we will do, we will do it. But before that, let me just make a very um, short stop. What happens if environment is not uniform? And that's why the speed would be different. So what happens in this particular case? Well, obviously, if it's around a point, this will no longer be a sphere. It would be some kind of maybe an ellipsoid or whatever it is. Depends on how is the speed of light in this particular um, environment. So maybe there is something like a border here between two different um, parts of space. So here light goes with, with one particular speed and when it reaches the another environment like between air and glass, all right, the speed would be less or greater, whatever it is. So these would be smaller and this would be greater around the point. So it's no longer a sphere, it would be something else. So wave front depends on um, properties of the environment because it depends on the speed of light. Speed of light is different. In glass, for instance, as we know, speed of light is less, uh, like about one and a half time less than in vacuum. So we were talking about the uniform environment and we were talking about non-uniform environment and the speed is different and that's what change that's what changes the wave form from original 
whatever original was, spherical or cylindrical or uh, plain. Um, so whatever was originally, it changes. And that's why direction will no longer be you know, straight from this point, as in a spherical case, it might actually change direction. And that would be actually the source of such phenomena as uh, reflection, for, uh, ref refraction, for, for example. But we will talk about this at the uh, ne next lecture. All right, what else is necessary? Well, what's necessary is there are some problems with this theory. I mean, look at this. This light from the secondary, secondary light uh, is emitted in all different directions. But the real rays of light we see as propagating direct lines from the source in the uniform environment, right? So how can I explain that um, the light actually goes along the straight line in, in the uniform environment based on this theory? Well, quite frankly, I can come up with some explanation. Um, it's really very shaky, but nevertheless, I'll, 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 I'll talk about how it could have been explained um, without really saying that this is a real rigorous explanation uh, according to this theory. So let's just consider one particular example of light source. It's very convenient actually to assume that the light source is an infinite plane, in which case in which case my light goes along straight lines, right? So let's say the light has reached certain level. Now I'm talking about right now section of this picture, two dimension. So from some source of light, parallel lights reach this particular uh, wave front. So what happens then from this wave front? Well, we are saying that each point uh, on the wave front is a source of secondary um, oscillations. So oscillations goes to all directions. Well, these oscillations to this direction are obviously continuing this straight line. Now, what happens with other? This one, this one, this one, this one, this one. So all these other oscillations so what happens? Well, I can suggest something. Let's consider this and this. These two um, rays of light emitted by these two points. You see, it's like two forces actually going at angle to each other, but they are equal in, um, in the strengths. They are completely symmetrical. So what would be the equivalent force to this one? But obviously, if you uh, add this vector and this vector, you will have this vector, right? So it looks like each pair of lights, of rays of lights, will result in oscillations going this way. Because, the os because again, you can really represent each vector as the sum of these two vectors. These would be So these would be added together, but these are going against each other and cancel each other. So that's why the resulting um, uh, of, of these two uh, neighboring points uh, emitting symmetrical lights would be the one which goes this way. Well, <laughs> look, I'm not saying this is the real explanation. But it gives some, you know, reasonable approach, maybe, to this particular uh, uh, type of propagation. Now, <coughs> so we were talking about how can we explain certain things. Now, let's talk about difficulties of explanation of certain phenomena. So, first of all, I would like to talk about crepuscular theory, where... Um, it really goes against the experiment. 
So let's talk about source of light. And we will talk about small aperture. Small opening. And this is some kind of a screen. Now, if this is the source of parallel lights, what would be on the screen from the corpuscular standpoint? Well, obviously, those little corpuscles which are going, and again, it's, it's uh, parallel uh, rays of light perpendicular to this um, opening kind of thing. So, whatever goes in would be in, whatever goes out, not on the opening, will not go. So the picture which we will see on the screen will be a light spot here, which is exactly equal to the opening, right? That from the corpuscular uh, theory standpoint. Very reasonable. <coughs> now, what is the experiment showing? Well, experiment shows a completely different picture. There will, there will be light here, and will be light here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here. So light would be actually going this way. Now, corpuscular theory will not be able to explain it. Um, now, the wave theory is capable of explaining this, and I'm not going into the details of how it is explained, my purpose is to criticize the corpuscular theory. So that was one of the reasons why people like Huygens really were, were thinking about something else, some other theory. Now, <coughs> um, what's interesting, the picture would not be uh, like this is the brightest spot and then the brightest is gradually decreasing as we go out. Um, it will be some spots, bright spots and dark spots, brights and uh, uh, bright spots and dark spots as well, which is a completely different kind of phenomenon. It's called diffraction. So, from from the wave standpoint, since each point here is the source of light, obviously light goes into all directions. And you remember I was talking about cancellation of of light. Now the lights here emitted by points which are on the very close to the edge don't have as many neighbors uh, as, the, uh, as the points which are in the middle of this opening. So that's why it would be less here and less here and more towards the center of it. <coughs> okay, so this is one of the kind of a critical point about corpuscular theory. Now, does the wave theory uh, has some kind of difficulties? Oh, absolutely. And uh, let me just enumerate them, at least for the purpose of this lecture. First of all, if you remember, Huygens was thinking that light is oscillations of ether and longitudinal oscillations of ether. Well, by now we know two things. Number one, there is no ether. There were many experiments um, that show that ether cannot really exist. Ether should um, have, it, it should have certain properties which it cannot really have to satisfy certain experimental facts. So that's number one. Number two, again, by now we know that it's oscillations of electromagnetic field and um, it's not longitudinal, it's, uh, uh, how is it called, uh, I forgot the name. So it's, it goes across, not along the, um, the direction of propagation of light. So the propagation of light is this, but oscillations are this, not this as the sound would uh, propagate in the air. So these are longitudinal. And this is trans something. Okay. okay. <coughs> so that's number one. Number two. I have tried to explain how the 
parallel lights actually goes forward and all these all these light uh, all these rays of light somehow cancel each other and uh, have the equivalent light goes straight forward but to tell you the truth it's a very shaky explanation I mean it needs some good math uh, to, to, to support it and uh, I'm not going to go into this obviously uh, it, it, it's not a, a real uh, a, a rigorous explanation of this particular thing so the propagation of the light along the straight line is kind of questionably explained by this particular Huygens uh, theory next is um, now at some point uh, people discovered the phenomenon of polarization of light well, right now, we know that polarization is related to the following thing. If this is the direction of propagation of light, and we have um, the uh, oscillations of um, electromagnetic field, these oscillations are not in one particular place. It's three-dimensional, so it's, it's every plate has it. So the oscillation goes in all the different directions um, perpendicular to the propagation of light and if I have some material like for instance crystal of tourmaline um, which led through only in one particular plane because their internal crystal structure is such a way that it does not um, let the light to propagate in all the different uh, planes uh, then you will have this particular uh, polarization because what happens is if you will take this tourmaline crystal for instance which goes this way you will see the light which are less bright and then if you will go to another tourmaline crystal which is turned by 90 degrees so it's this particular um, uh, direction uh, which is supposed to um, let the light go then it will be dark completely here because this one lets light only in one particular um, oscillation plate but this one doesn't let it because it's turned around so there is dark here so this is the polarization of light instead of oscillating in all the different directions perpendicular to the propagation it goes only along one particular um, uh, flat plane and that cannot be explained by the Huygens principle what else photoelectric effect light can actually um, hitting some surface light can actually cause certain electrons to go out from that surface like it really it hits them and uh, kicks them out from the surface so if you have some kind of a metal plate and you have light here there are certain electrons which are kicked out from the surface and if you have some kind of a um, source of uh, potential energy electric energy these electrons can actually move from one to another really making electric current so electric current would exist uh, when the light moves on it cannot be explained it can be explained by corpuscular theory because all these little corpuscles are really like hitting the atoms of the surface and can kick out the electrons but the wave theory cannot do it and then there is another well kind of strange thing you see if you have certain lights let's say parallel lights this is the wavefront so we were talking about this picture which causes the light to go this but again if each point on the wavefront is actually the cause of secondary uh, waves so there is actually the whole 
uh, sphere, uh, the light goes into all directions, including this one. Which means light should actually propagate backwards as well. So yeah, according to this theory, light would propagate backwards as well as forward, which is not the case. Light goes only one direction. So that's just another little difficulty with this particular theory. However, it was a tremendous step forward. Even if it's an ether, even if it's longitudinal, not um, uh, not, not the uh, oscillations across the uh, propagation light. Still, this particular theory was extremely important uh, for um, the development of uh, the light series and the uh, electromagnetic field and uh, Maxwell's uh, electromagnetic field uh, explanation with his uh, equations, etc. So it played a very, very important role in, in physics of the time. And that basically was the point I would, I would like to make. Okay, so thanks very much. Uh, I do suggest you to read the um, explanation to this particular lecture on unizor.com. Every lecture has the uh, explanation, uh, textual explanation. It basically can you can read it as a textbook, um, and uh, obviously it's part of the course. So I do suggest you to take the whole course of physics as well as the course of mathematics which is also on the same website it's called math for teens so good luck thank you